Oi, pre-training once for models of all sizes. Pretty cool paper today. Uh, if you've ever heard of Matroshka models, this is a sim very similar to that, those ones. Uh, interestingly, got a crazy teacher distillation, all that stuff set up. And it seems like a pretty good way if you care about uh, post-training your models, having the ability to use different computations, uh, computational capacity, whatever, or difficulty at inference time, such as, for example, low resource settings, then this seems like it'd be pretty useful. Also, just as a regularization technique, I thought it was pretty cool uh, in terms of leading to very high performance. I believe they did hit some state-of-the-art examples, state-of-the-art benchmarks here. So, cool stuff. Before we start, like, subscribe, comment, all the YouTube things, hit the bell. If you want to support me financially, you can hit that join button down below as low as a dollar a month, also three, five, ten bucks, whatever you'd like, or on Patreon as well. That'll get you access to, um, to videos early before they come out. And hit me up on LinkedIn, Twitter, all that stuff. But anyways, let's get started. So pre-training once for all, or POA, is built on a teacher-student self-distillation framework. Now, I'm going to be mentioning this at some points in the video for the most part. The thing I am curious about with this paper has less so to do with the self-distillation stuff, more so to do with the actual way in which they are splicing up these uh, matrices of the models and getting into loss functions and things. But uh, keep that in mind. I'm going to be kind of skipping over or ignoring partially sometimes a lot of the teacher-student stuff for this paper to focus on my own interests, right? But for now, a quick rundown of it, right? There is an inelastic and an elastic student branch. Those are two terms they use. These student branches have parameter sharing, meaning they're actually using the same parameters. And at each pre-training pre step, what they do for the elastic one is they randomly sample a subset of parameters from the intact student to form the corresponding elastic student. So they are kind of uh, encouraging a sort of, sort of self-similarity uh, across not just the model itself, but also all of its subcomponents. They want all of its subcomponents to be separately intact working, or not intact, what's the wrong word to use here because I don't want to get confusing. Um, they want th the purpose of this elastic student is to kind of ensure that any combination of uh, parameters in the total model, the total intact student, uh, are in fact can function on their own with the hopes that this as a sort of regularization type technique will overall improve performance. And now both of these students, the intact and the elastic, are trained to emulate the output of the teacher network. And the teacher itself, interestingly, is made up of the same uh, parameters, um, a bit different though. It's a continually refined uh, exponential moving average of the student's parameters, right? So as the student, param the student parameters change over time, uh, the teacher parameters change slowly or more slowly given that they are just an, ex an EMA. But what we have here is very interesting where we have three levels. We have the randomly picked out subcomponents, we have the model itself, and then we have an exponential moving average of the history of that model's parameters. The uh, first one being the elastic student, the second one being the intact student, and the final one being the teacher. Now, the other part of the goal of the elastic student is not just as a regularization technique, kind of, sort of, but more so uh, to allow for post hoc during inference, the full extraction of high performance sub networks from the pre-trained teacher, right? So what they're hoping is that they have only trained a model of one specific size, right? But despite training one model of one size, they can basically just take subsets of that model, splices of the matrices, right? And use those as their own models for any use case that might require lower computes, smaller matrices, smaller model size, that kind of thing. Now, to the best of their knowledge, they said that POA is the first method capable of training multiple size models concurrently. Uh, asterisk there. So the reason I'm kind of into this, if you've been on my channel for a while, is there is a series of papers uh, they use the term matryoshka, which actually is pronounced matryoshka, I believe, where basically they do something similar with splicing out smaller models. However, the, I believe, difference here, I'm still a bit iffy on if this is actually true. Um, I know it's true for the matryoshka models that when you choose to train these multiple model sizes that are um, splices of each other, actually, let's hop into a description of what they are for a second. Let's teach out some matryoshka models right here. So basically, in a Matryoshka model, let's say you have a given embedding vector of length d, right? 
what a Matryoshka model does is it says, hey, how about while we train the primary model with this embedding vector size, let's also simultaneously train a model that has embedding vectors of half the size where, so D over two, right? Where those half size vectors are just splices of the original ones. And this goes on recursively down to whatever smallest model size you would like. Uh, by the way, the whole divide by two thing is just a hyperparameter choice. You could also do instead of a exponential geometric, whatever change of size of, of them, you could also do a linear change in size and it would actually work a little bit better, but this is the original way it was done. And so then for every single weight matrix in your model, what happens is you end up having to splice those corresponding weight matrices. And sometimes said splicing can look the same as the embedding vector splicing, AKA only splicing along one single dimension, but other times you end up having to splice along two dimensions. It just depends on the specifics of that matrix operation and what makes sense in the given moments. Um, the MLP versus the attention mechanism work a bit differently in this regard for an actual transformer doing this, but basically you can create nested transformers that are simultaneously trained in your main transformer. That's what a Matryoshka model is, right? And I say transformers because that's what I'm curious about, but obviously you can do other things too. Any kind of neural network with weight matrices, you can figure out a way to do the splicing mechanism and make it work this way. Now, the problem with the Matryoshka style is that at the end of the model, the actual uh, way it works is you have to effectively maintain an entire separate gradient information and uh, as well as just throughput results for every single model size. So here, for example, we have three. We have the purple size, the pink size, and the green size, right? In this case, you are effectively taking up three times the RAM with your gradients than you otherwise would because you're effectively training three models simultaneously that just happen to have some parameter sharing. And what that means is that while you can guess train multiple models simultaneously of different sizes on the same task, the problem is that compared to just training a single regular model, um, you are limited in the size of your largest model when you do Matryoshka. Because you had to do this simultaneous three gradients at once, you could have instead just chosen to do a single much larger model. So there's a huge trade-off here. It's really only worth doing something like this if you have plenty of compute and you really know you're going to need extremely constrained and dynamic inference um, needs after you finish your pre-training period and once it's actually in deployments, you would only want to do a Matryoshka setting if you don't need a top performance model, if what you need is very, very small, very, very high performance and very interchangeable models. The key thing being here is that because you're doing this Matryoshka setup, instead of a regular just training separate model sizes individually, you actually end up with the smallest models being roughly a little bit smarter than they otherwise would be and being more self-similar to the larger versions of the Matryoshka models, which is very useful in terms of maintaining consistent output, even despite having to switch between different model sizes during your actual constrained inference setting. Whereas if you want to actually build the best model possible, you should not do Matryoshka because you can end, instead train a very, very large uh, model in comparison to what you would be able to do with your maximum size Matryoshka model, right? Now, in this paper, um, when they say they have the first um, method capable, I can't remember if they actually did cite and were aware of Matryoshka and, um, or if they were not. If they were not, they might be just, um, it might have the same effect as Matryoshka, I believe, where like they still have the maximum model size being limited. But I believe what's happening here is that they are referring to a different thing than what I just said with Matryoshka in the sense that with these models here in POA, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we might actually find out the answer later in this paper. I, I could be forgetting, honestly. I believe that the maximum possible size of the maximum model being trained in this method is less limited than it is in the Matryoshka setting. That is my very loose impression. I, I, I'm not sure though, throughout this paper, we might find the answer to that, but that is a big uh, distinguisher, is if someone can figure out a method that allows for this multi-scale size model training, and still train the largest model at the largest possible size and no compromise in model size, that would be crazy. I'm not confident we may see later whether this does that or not. Um, if it doesn't, then it's really uh, not as big of an improvement on the Matryoshka models that I would have liked to see, but there is still some interesting stuff in here we will get into.
They do have some kind of state-of-the-art results. We'll see later. And their experiments were on uh, Vision Transformer, uh, whatever Swin Transformer is. I believe it's a linear in some manner transformer as opposed to quadratic and ResNet. So we're probably going to come back to this image and reference it frequently. Um, but let's go in an initial rundown. Uh, for example, this is, I believe, the Vision Transformer setup. So input images and coming out to, I believe, classification loss in terms of like dog, plane, whatever classification is my impression. But you take the original input image, right, X, this Shih Tzu or something, I'm not quite sure. And interestingly, they actually crop and grab different parts of the image. Uh, that seems to be a, uh, what's it called, uh, manipulation technique, regularization, whatever. There's a term for it in image modeling as to like um, splicing and adding noise and all that stuff. I forget on the top of my head right now, though. And basically, you have the teacher model, right, the intact students, and then you have the elastic student. The actual teacher and intact student have the exact same uh, dimensions and all their matrices of the entire model is my impression but the teacher is an exponential moving ouch whereas the intact student actually moves based off gradient descent which is interesting right um, the teacher is an ema of the intact student and then the elastic student actually directly has weight tying so intact and elastic student are directly weight tied together Whereas the teacher doesn't have a direct weight tying. Again, it is using an EMA, right? The elastic student is a seemingly random, I believe, or some, to some structure, splices of the intact student's weights and embedding vectors and everything. And then for loss functions, we'll get into which ones are which here, but they do have an, a little bit of an odd setup in loss functions where uh, simultaneously the teacher, I believe, uh, does have the main loss function, and then the intact student and elastic student have slightly odd ones that we will look into in a bit, along with what I believe might be some kind of distillation or something. I'm not sure, I forget, but we will confirm that and give me a minute or two as we're reading. So they do leverage distillation, right? So they are distilling from teacher model down to both of these students. Uh, both the intact and elastic students are distilled from the teacher using different views of the same image, right? So the teacher, um, and the students had a different input to the image, but they are both required to classify the image as a dog or whatever it is. And despite having different input information, uh, the students then have a, a some kind of distillation loss somewhere in here, maybe here, maybe in the diagram, where they are encouraged to get the final same output logits as the teacher. Oddly, despite having a somewhat different actual image input, which I really like that idea to think about it. It is just a way, if you ever have uh, different uh, models that could take different inputs, I imagine there's a lot more robustness giving them both different information as opposed to the more trivial uh, case of giving them both the entire image. And now the elastic student additionally has a distillation learning from the intact student. Um, despite the, um, but it's also using identical view. So they both the intact and elastic student use a, a single view of the input image and the elastic student, AKA the spliced out subnetworks are encouraged distillation wise to have the same output logits as the intact student. And now to be clear, the way the EMA update on the teacher works, it is not just an EMA update from the intact student. Uh, the actual uh, weight gradient changes to the uh, elastic student do also get added uh, into that EMA. Now, how do we actually splice out the elastic student? Um, they use different kinds of models here, but for context, uh, with a transformer backbone, when they say the word width, that refers to the dimensionality of the tokens, whereas for a convolutional backbone, the width indicates the number of channels. Um, for sake of me explaining things today in this video, assume regular transformer and dimensionality of tokens. That's just what I'm more comfortable with, but Again, this does work across different types of models and weight matrices setups and everything. You should be able to find a way to make this work with an RNN, LSTM, whatever. You just have to be a little dynamic and uh, a, little, a little willing to take some liberties with how you do your splicing and what makes sense for that given architecture. And we'll be discussing today in terms of a transformer with um, language tokens. Now, they, when they say depth, that determines the, uh, the number of basic blocks in either a transformer or convolutional network. So we're just talking about number of layers in a transformer here when we say depth. Width and, width and depth are the two main axes in which the splicing happens. Here we have a little illustration, again, like I showed earlier with the way that these, with the way that in Matryoshka models things were spliced. Uh, it is pretty similar here with the elastic student. So we have tokens and they get spliced to some degree 
And interestingly, I didn't do this in my own Matroshka Transformer recreation, my Matt former, but when they the the increments that they use to splice on correspond to the number of heads. So if you have uh, eight heads in your transformer, then there are eight different increments on which you can splice down the model to. And whenever you do a splice, it removes a specific head from your tension mechanism. That's one way to do it that I had not thought of till reading this paper. The way I had done it in the past with the Matroshka model corresponded more so to something like this, where I was messing with the actual dimensionality of each head. So interesting thing there. I totally see why their method is should be superior improved at least intuitively anyways also of note here that i do not believe the matroshka authors did but that they added in here that totally makes sense once they say it is they have an additional when they do the splicing right so if you recognize this notation from actual just splicing and pytorch um bracket colon etc whatever right when they do their splicing they actually have an extra term a multiplicative scalar on the end right here that is a hyperparameter that represents the scaling factor well, is it hyperparameter? It represents the scaling factor to cope with the reduction of input dimension. So basically, when you splice out from you have your weight matrix and you splice it out right, um, you now literally have just fewer numbers in the this new smaller weight matrix that you've got. And to account for the way that would change the distribution of the vectors coming in and out, uh, this scale factor term adjusts and ensures that your output uh of the weight matrix map mole is still um in the same distribution as if you had never spliced anything which i imagine is probably great for learning huge addition right there um to the idea it might have been done before as far as i know or like i don't i don't know but i don't remember ever seeing this in any of the matroshka papers very very cool and the way you calculate that scaling factor is just your maximum possible as in largest model dimension divided by whatever dimension of the model that you've spliced out right so if you splice out half then uh the scaling factor will just be two now they do not they do not only elastic widths and elastic widths both affect the token embeddings as well as the attention uh, mechanism by, in terms of number of heads and the mlp in terms of the actual hidden dimension width but they also do elastic depths right n plus one elastic depths by combining elastic widths and depths, they can generate a total of n plus 1 times m plus 1 distinct subnetworks. One of these referring to the width, one to the depth, and you can do any combination of them. So in this graph we saw earlier on the, uh, let's call this the uh, x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis maybe, z for vertical, um, the elastic width, right? They are scaling based off of the actual token dimension width, and then the elastic depth or scaling number of layers in the model. And because of this, you can scale both of them. You get every possible combination and a pretty smooth curve from smallest model up to largest with, of course, the largest having the highest accuracy up here in bright yellow and the smallest width and depth model having the lowest accuracy down here in the dark blue. But Again, the great thing about training a model in this in this fa uh, bleh, in this fashion or in the Matroshka fashion is that these smaller models down here, the worst performing ones, they actually do a bit better than if you had just trained a solo model of that small size. And the way in which they do better is more reflective, is more in line with the distribution of your large model. You can expect your outputs of the small model to be more consistently similar to the large model, uh, as well as just more accurate than a standalone trained small model. And consistency in actual outputs might be super useful in terms of if you wanted to create some kind of, I don't know, prompt engineering deployment, whatever system that attempted to intelligently use different model sizes for different tasks or something, because you are staying more in distribution, it might be easier switch back and forth from large to small model in terms of the small model is an easy task. The large model is not thrown totally off course from its own expected uh, RLHF type distribution, but it still gets, you still get to save on compute for those easier tasks in your sequence. And to be clear, all the splicing stuff during pre-training for every single iteration, what they are doing is randomly selecting one of these sub networks for the elastic student to use 
during that iteration of pre-training, which I believe means during every single batch. Now again, earlier I said that the kind of Matroshka style splicings part and the teacher distillation part can be thought of as a little bit separate, although they definitely found a great case for the teacher distillation uh, augmenting the otherwise Matroshka similar methodology. If you're not familiar, distillation loss, it just looks like regular cross degree loss, except for instead of using the one hot vectors of your classification, you are using the actual probabilities gained by the teacher model uh, to affect the student model. It can be mixing them up right here, but it's a pretty simple uh, regular uh, negative P log P equation, right? Just the you know, P's are referring to different probability um, sources. And now, so that distillation loss from teacher to intact student is pretty simple. Uh, whereas the elastic student has a slightly more complex loss function. It actually has two distillation terms, one in which it is trying to learn from the teacher model and one in which it's trying to learn from the uh, intact students. Now, they also this thing that I'm not quite sure I understand here, didn't bother to delve too deeply into it. I gotta stop using the word delve, chat GPT, damn. Anyways, to ensure sufficient training of each sub network from the elastic student, we introduce multiple projection heads positioned after the backbone network. Each projection head has exactly the same structure, except for a different number of prototypes. Um, prototype, I believe, I'm so not used to the vision. Uh, I think that's just referring to the actual number of um, possible classification categories. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's a stupid thing I should definitely know. And I think what they're saying here is instead of a single output head of size vocabulary or of size um, 10 for CFR 10 or 100 for CFR 100, I think they have a lot of projection heads in which some of them just don't even have as an option um, certain certain classes, certain actual outputs is my impression. Uh, I suppose that should work as like a regularization thing maybe or something. I'm not quite sure, honestly. I did not bother to actually delve into this at all delve again delve but it's an interesting thing to think about um would it make sense to have the model uh give it multiple different output heads each of which pre uh, attempts to predict a different subset of total classes and i guess just has to do nothing whenever uh the relevant class to be trained on is not in its listed prototypes i i suppose i don't know very out of my depth right there the prototype word got me a little messed up and all i did was one sentence off of this or two sentences um, which I thought was a little bit odd. I think it's probably more um, obvious what's happening here. If I were a vision person, maybe I missed something. I don't know. Uh, the vision VIT, I think, uh, has 143 total subnetworks. The SWIN transformer has 39, and the ResNet has 465. Remember, those numbers are gotten from number of uh, width dimensions to split on and number of depth layers to split on as well, right? They pre-train these models, I assume in coder style or something, not quite sure what's happening here, with uh, ImageNet 1K uh, without the labels, without labels makes me think they're doing something weird here. Um, representation learning, I believe, because they were centering prototypes and things. I think the uh, prototype idea, actually, I was wrong earlier, I think, it's um, a thing from representation image whatever learning uh, that I don't know very well, but I did do some, read some papers talking about uh, prototypes uh, and cosine similarity, I want to say like a year ago or something. So I think it's more so a uh, naturally learned emergent categories thing as opposed to using labels to learn your final output categories. These are a bunch of classification accuracy metrics of some sort, not quite sure. Seems like the POA method does do pretty consistently or somewhat consistently better uh, than most uh, other alternatives. The multiple projection head thing does seem to improve performance somehow. And I want to just read off their logic here. Maybe you can understand it better than I can. The design consideration behind MPH is that for each pre-training iteration, the subnetwork is chosen randomly, leading to a relatively insufficient optimization. That part makes sense. And then the MPH introduces different sets of prototypes, which act as multiple semantic spaces for presentation learning, enabling the teacher to distill various aspects of the learned knowledge into the subnetwork. Oh, okay. I think I'm more so understanding is it would be very hard to distill given the random randomly selected subnetworks um, off of every single. It'd be very hard to distill off of every single prototype ending category classification wise or whatever. But because they're choosing just 
uh, every I think every possible subset of ending classification categories, aka prototypes, um, what you end up with is uh, there are certain ones that are pretty that have a pretty useful uh, outputs for distillation from big model to small model, and then it's that gap from teacher to elastic that they are trying to help fix with this multiple projection head thing. Still pretty unsure about that whole thing, but whatever. Later in the article, they do discuss different possibilities for different um, ways that could have gone about this. For example, um, they could have had the teacher itself be elastic, or they could have not done an intact student. They could have had both of those things simultaneously. Um, but the one that they discussed in this paper, I believe they said ended up being the highest performant um, of the variants that they tried out. Uh, if you were already a little bit suspicious of this EMA update thing to the teacher, um, keep in mind a lot of work in the past has already shown not just the study they, they, they cited, but also just a lot of stuff I've seen before. Um, averaging weights it does surprisingly well. You really wouldn't think so, but you can take really just average two models that were trained entirely separately, and they do surprisingly well after averaging, even sometimes showing improvements on a lot of different regimes and methodologies, depending on how you do it exactly. And so to that extent, the EMA update thing is semi-reasonable, um, as well as the whole like sub-network EMA thing. Like you, it, it's, it's not that surprising that it doesn't destroy everything and it actually helps. Anyway, that's it for today. Thank you all for watching. Like, subscribe, comment, all the YouTube things. Join the uh, Discord server. Connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter and whatnot. If you want to schedule a consultation with me, there's also a link in my link to schedule a Zoom type meeting. Uh, and that should be it, I guess. Yeah, end of video.